Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Admiral Jim Robb, president of the National Training and Simulation Association, I would like to invite you to this month's webinar. Uh, Admiral Robb was unable to be with us today. I'm Dr. Brett Ulander, chair of the NTSA Executive Committee, and we're happy to have you all with us today. Today's webinar is focused on advances in human performance and looks to the future in defining ways to systematically optimize human performance through precise measurement and technologies that are target performance at the physical, cognitive, behavioral, social, and even emotional levels. Our panel of speakers today are experts in their field and have taken time today to share the current work they're doing. I know that when you registered the event, you were able to submit questions. Uh, we have a, those list of questions and we invite you to uh, put questions in the question block on that tab. Uh, during the session. I would now like to introduce the moderator of today's event, Dr. Daniel Serfidi. He is the founder and CEO of Aptima, and his life work has focused on learning and human performance. He also chairs our webinar planning committee for NTSA. Dr. Serfidi, welcome to you and your panelists. I will now turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me today to moderate this uh, this panel of superstars basically in our field um, human performance is very much uh, in the mind of many of us that are in the training and simulation uh, business uh, because it's essentially where we are what we are trying to improve and sustain um, however only a small subset of us paradoxically focuses on human performance and in the past few years, uh, personally, as uh, the, the CEO of a company dedicated to human-centered uh, engineering, I've noticed an increased interest in uh, the intricacies, the theories, the measures, uh, the, uh, the technologies around human performance, precisely because there's so much technology that surrounds us. As we introduce AI, artificial intelligence, and, and uh, extended reality, and other advanced analytics to help us improve human performance, paradoxically, there is a renewed focus on the human, uh, the very part of the system that we are trying to help with all this technology. And so I'm delighted, really, to moderate this panel today. Um, an old mentor of mine, General John Cushman, who passed a couple of years ago, uh, uh, was a retired three-star from uh, the U.S. Army, used to say something that uh, has been kind of my motto personally for many years. You cannot improve what you don't measure. And you can't measure what you don't understand. And the it in those sentences is really human performance. He was managing very large army exercises and watching people saying, oh, that was great. And his first question was always, how do you know? How do you know that there was an improvement? And so uh, this is really what this panel is about. We've received uh, many, many, many questions ahead of this panel. So there is no way we, won't be, we will be able to uh, cover them all. Uh, but we promise to try to address uh, a, a large portion of them and continue. And if there is enough interest, who knows? We may have uh, the future of human performance part two appearing in our webinar uh, calendar soon. Our panel uh, that I'll introduce in a second comes from a very different uh, angle to this notion of human performance. Um, the uh, each one of us uh, had different academic training. I am an aerospace engineer by training, and I've always been fascinated more by what's what happened between the ears of the pilots as opposed to the shape of the wing, the wings, or the or the fuselage. And this this curiosity as a system engineer, as an aerospace engineer, is one angle into human performance. My Next, uh, my, my panelists here actually come at it also from different angles. We have Dr. Kay Stanny, who is currently the, um, uh, the CEO and also the founder of a major company operating in this field called Design Interactive, 
come at it from a cognitive perspective. And we're going to hear from her in a, in a few minutes. Uh, Dr. Phil Wagner is actually a medical uh, doctor. Some people will say the only real doctor in this panel, but that's another story. Um, the, uh, uh, and he comes at it from a sports, fitness, but also health perspective, the physical dimension, if you wish, of human performance. Dr. Kara Orvis, who is the uh, senior vice president of research and engineering and my colleague at Aptima comes at it as an organizational industrial psychologist um, looking at it from a behavioral and social perspective, how teams interact with each other and how we can improve. And so you have all these dimensions. Uh, all, all My panelists are not only top uh, scientists in their field, they are also top executives in the field, as you can see from their resume. So Kay, Phil and Kara, welcome to the panel. And we're going to start, uh, for our audience, we're going to start by having each one of the panelists uh, present five minutes, just a, a quick snapshot of what they are interested in. And then we'll engage into the Q&A. Again, I'm repeating what, um, what uh, Rene asked us to do uh, as the organizer here, as well as Brett asked us to do as the chair of this session, which is post additional question in the QA, the Q&A section. And we will take a look at them and try to answer them the best we can. Thank you very much. And we were gonna start with Dr. K. Stani K, it's all yours. Thank you, Danielle. And thanks for including me in this webinar. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide our insights and perspective on the future of human performance. And the way we see it is if you look at industrial revolutions, you know, um, we, we're at Industry 4.0, and what does that mean? You know, when, in the first industrial, uh, uh, industrial Revolution, we focused on mechanization. So steam power and weaving looms and things that could mechanically support us. And then we went into mass production and assembly lines so we could get more done. And then we wanted to get, go beyond getting more done by the humans, so we went to automation and computerization and electronics. In the latest Industry 4.0, where we're at, is we're starting still with the technology, but soon the real asset will be the data and the cyber physical systems that we interconnect through the Internet of Things and the networks and the cloud computing. And that's when it'll get really interesting. And, and um, so if we go to, yeah, I forgot, I'm in control here. Uh, if we go to the next slide here, what we see is our perspective of where things are in terms of the, the digital enablement that's going to happen. So we're going to start with what we're familiar with and kind of um, com comfortable with, and that is with extended reality technology. And we can get point of need support with this technology. So again, much like with the third industrial revolution, we're, we're really talking about with just extended reality, we're talking about the technology. And so with that technology, we can increase work effic efficiency, which is really what we've been up to in the other industrial revolutions, is getting more out with the aid of different types of uh, technical and, um, and physical support. And so XR alone, that's where we're at. We're kind of still in industry 3.0, and it's just aided by the technology. Um, one of the things that I'm really pushing my group to do is to couple that technology with a different kind of design. Right now, one of our biggest frustrations is when we get in, you know, don all the high-tech equipment and we get into the virtual or augmented world, and we, what do we find awaiting us? Floating menus, floating icons, these 2D paradigms, which were perfect for your laptop computer or your tablet, don't really suit us well in the 3D space. And if you just slap all this stuff in the space, then what you're doing is, re you know, really reducing efficiency because you've got too many distractors and too much to contend with. And so this is a place where real ingenious new design needs to happen. And there haven't been a ton of gains yet. We've come up with one little clever things, which we call proximity designs. And so the augmented assets don't come into play until you're close to them and you actually need them. So you're not cluttering the space with distractors. But there's so, and we have other things that we've been doing in spatial design, but there's so much more that's needed. And I kind of have this vision 
of we had, you know, back in, in the day when we brought together all the folks in, in Choose Your Axe Park and they created the first GUIs. That was a lot of different mindsets coming together, thinking in very different ways, and they came up with something very clever and unique that tore down the barriers to computing. You know, it was no longer a C prompt. It was something I could, you know, tangibly click and, and, and manipulate, and it made computing accessible. So we, you know, that was a good thing for 2D design, but now we need to break away from that and really start to up our game with regard to the design so that we can get a more intuitive interaction with our XR systems. But then the next three levels are, to me, the most interesting. You know, here's where we're coupling XR with, with AI and ML, so that we're really focused now more on the data that, that we can generate from these systems through the Internet of Things and what we can do with those data. So if we take just XR and we couple it with AI ML, what we can do is to start to adapt and personalize our point of need support. And here we can really get more gains in effectiveness, not just only efficiency. So I can understand what you're good at, what you're bad at. I can give you what you need when you need it, you know, at the point of need. I can manipulate the information. So it's really catered to your abilities, your strengths, your weaknesses, and supports you individually. And that personalized support will really up the gains that we're seeing as we see on the exponential curve here on the right. And then once we start to, to close the loop between the system and the XR you know, display technology through digital twins, where we have a representation of the system that we're interacting with, here's where we can get all of the like, much more gains in terms of a hyper-enabled enterprise and we get really prescriptive and predictive you know, indications of what the system needs and, and um, where the system's at and, you know, we, we know a lot about the system and we can interact with it and optimize it and really hyper enable it with the data. And then finally, if we close the loop with the human, and here's where I think it's the most interesting, and we start to develop digital phenotypes of the human, not just the system, now we've closed the loop between the display, the system, and the human, and we can start to be really responsive to what that individual needs. And here's where, where we can really not only hyper-enable the enterprise, but hyper-enable the human, and beyond the enterprise. And that's, to me, one of the most interesting things that I think can happen. And so here, if we think about the you know, digital twin piece of it, we're going to do, you know, we're going to take the Internet of Things, we're going to censor everything up, we're going to have lots of big data to drive system integrations and automation so everything's talking to one another. And we can do a whole lot of simulating and then we can take all that information and present it at the point of need and really up our game in terms of you know, interacting with the system and optimizing performance. But if we take it to the next level, and we take it not only within, but outside of the enterprise. This is where I get really excited. Because imagine if going to work actually made you a better communicator or a better decision maker or better at coping with stress. Because we always are censored up these days. I mean, every, you know, so many people have a watch already. Uh, and every click we ever make on our systems is captured. And there's so much AI and ML behind that to push advertising and make money. But what if we used all of those data to actually make the, the human a, you know, better at coping with emotions better physically, you know, we capture their emotion, uh, the, the way they do their work. And, and, and instead of getting, you know, tar carpal tunnel, we actually guide them in working in a more effective physical way. So once we have a digital phen phenotype of the human, coupled with the digital twin of the system, coupled with the XR technology that can provide that data at the point of need, now we just really have an empowered human and an empowered system so that all parties are benefiting from the latest industrial revolution. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Kay. That's very inspiring um, and a little bit frightening, uh, actually. But uh, that's uh, but that's, it's happening already, Danielle. I know. I know. <laughs> it's just not used for good. It's used for making money. We could use it for, for good. So anyway. exactly, it is. It is to be used for good to improve uh, human lives, basically. So talking about about that. Thank you, Kay. We'll come back to that. I have tons of questions already that are directed at at you, the, um, uh, the next uh, presenter is gonna be uh, Phil, uh, who is uh, running a company called Sparta Science, uh, and he's gonna tell us about another aspect of human performance uh, that may be very complementary to what we just heard from Kay. Phil. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of what Kay described with, with data being used for good um, certainly is in line with, you know, our, our philosophy. I think we, we look at, you know, movement as a key piece to that data. 
um, just because movement really underlies every health condition we have at every stage of life. Um, and how can we better understand how individuals move, not only how it impacts injuries and physical health, but also cognitive and psychological aspects of that individual. And how can we truly start to measure that movement consistently, much like a vital sign? Um, and we see a key piece to this is identifying leading and lagging KPIs when it comes to movement, when it comes to, at least from our perspective, physical performance. And a key piece of that is identifying you know, the right leading, lagging, key performance indicators. You know, if we take an example uh, from medicine, you know, one of the better coupled examples is diabetes and blood glucose or diabetes and hemoglobin H1C. Because um, what we've seen is what used to take weeks to analyze blood values now is a simple finger prick. And so how can we provide better leading indicators like that finger prick, you know, to identify some of the lagging KPIs or outcomes that we're really seeking to improve? You know, if we take an example from the military, a lot of the philosophies are based around what's called total force fitness. And that's kind of this lagging KPI of, how do we address the human and all these different aspects? And a good example is from a physical standpoint is when they looked at individuals going through basic combat training, what they found was, you know, that there was a pretty strong correlation between depressive symptoms and those that were passing their fitness tests at a higher level, right? So it gives insights into OK, if we look at the human as a whole and some of these outcomes, they're very interconnected. You know, so once at least again, using the military is, is an example, when we look at the total force fitness and some of the testing that's used, how can we actually identify the leading KPIs that are predictive of that or associated with that? Um, and there's really kind of two kinds of KPIs that we, we look at. One is the internal, which is how do you respond? And the other is the external. What's your actions that are being done? How much are you running? What are you sleeping? What type of exercises you're doing? And those external actions really affect all of us individually at an internal level very differently. And so how do we look at the biases between genders, but also ages, um, because every individual ultimately is gonna respond very differently. And we see this with you know, individuals already in healthcare, different medications are prescribed based on genetics, based on age, ethnicity, all these factors. How can we approach human performance in the same manner? You know, and a good example of frameworks that we've seen from a readiness standpoint at the military level is if we look at the Army combat fitness test and a goal is a two mile run, you know, how do we identify what's the best actions to pass that test or to optimize that test? And what's that response of each of those individuals using quick and easy assessments? And there's all sorts of information out there, you know, but we really are lacking on that internal piece and really measuring, and that's where data comes in. How does every individual respond through assessments differently? And so when we look at some of these leading KPIs, we're really looking at the data and is it reliable? Is it valid? Are we actually trying to measure what matters? You know, can it be easily deployed in the field? Is it practical? And most importantly, is it actionable? Is the data and insights we're collecting can we actually do something about it that changes or validates the decisions we're making? Thank you very much, Bill. Indeed, that's, um, I'm glad you extended that. And when you explain how movement and all these other apparently 
uh, uniquely physical dimension of human performance are actually affecting other the other dimensions, some of them that Kay mentioned earlier, the, the, the emotional and the and the cognitive, and all these things are uh, are linked. And perhaps the secret now, uh, the secret source of understanding all that is indeed the data that we are able to collect, that uh, on which we can apply our models and our analytics and our technology to. And so from the cognitive, the emotional to the to the physical, we are going now to our third panelist uh, for her five minutes uh, of fame. Uh, the uh, it's uh, Dr. Kara Ovis Kara, uh, who is also my colleague at Aptima in the interest of full disclosure. Uh, the, but we also uh, has been a, a really a deep expert in uh, in the aspect of not only individual human behavior but also multi-person or team human behavior. Um, Kara. Great, thank you, Danielle, and good morning to everyone. I'm really excited to participate in the discussion today. Um, I've had the pleasure of supporting the NTSA for a dozen or so years in various roles related to ITSIC. And I have to say, I was super impressed by the questions that the audience sent. I thought they were very thoughtful and thank you to the audience, that's wonderful. So as Danielle said, I am the Senior Vice President for Aptima's Research and Engineering Group. We have three divisions dedicated to training, human augmentation, and assessment and modeling. My group has uh, approximately 100 scientists and engineers from a variety of disciplines working on about 70 projects. Most of those have some tie-in with human performance. So in my role, I necessarily dabble at a very high level in lots of different areas related to human performance. However, today, I'm going to speak a little bit in my capacity as an expert on team performance. So I have a PhD, like Daniel said, in industrial organizational psychology, and I've been doing research with the DOD for 20 years, and that has mostly been focused on teamwork and leadership. I'm super passionate about it and appreciate any time to talk about it. Um, you know, the research on teams is longstanding and vast, and the four top bullets are some of the areas I found important when it comes to team performance in the DOD. One of those areas is team assessment. Yes, it's important to measure uh, the overall performance of the team, how effective they were and the mission that they were given, but it's also really important to focus on why the teams did or did not do their jobs well. So a lot of my research is focused on assessing three categories of team constructs. Those are how the team feels about their team, so how confident they are, how cohesive they are, how the team thinks as a team, do they have shared situational awareness, shared team mental models, and then how they actually work together as a team, how they set goals collaboratively, how they coordinate with each other. I've also worked within the domain of team learning and team training, and that's within two different areas. First, how do we train teams that are going to perform together? For example, what are the best, me best methods by which we can train teams to work together well? What are the states and processes we're trying to affect through training? Second, how do we use teams to train individual skills? The military relies a lot on social learning environments and team learning environments. So how do instructors set up the environment in which students can learn in a group setting where they feel comfortable making mistakes and giving each other feedback? How does uh, leadership influence the training context and ultimately what, uh, what advances in knowledge and skills the students walk away with? The third area is that of team design or team staffing. This is really looking at things like what are the individual teamwork skills that impact team performance? What's the combination of knowledge and skills that are critical for specific kinds of teams? How does member replacement, people moving in and out of teams, impact team performance? And finally, looking at team leadership. Leaders and leadership functions play a really important role in teamwork. And so understanding the leader's role and how they structure the task work of the team and how they develop the social functioning of the team is critical to how that team performs. And finally, you can study all of this in the context of many different kinds of teams. 
small face-to-face -face teams, distributed teams, human machine teams, small teams, and multi-team systems. So hopefully we'll touch on this, some of that today. Um, when I saw the questions from folks, I did want to mention, and this was another reason uh, Daniel invited me, is I'm currently serving as the NDIA Human Systems Division Chair, and we have a conference in Arlington this June. If you're interested in learning more about human performance or building your network around human performance, this is a great small conference to attend. So feel free to look that up. And it, it's just a good time to like sit down with people and talk about things that are related to human performance. I'll end there, Daniel. Thank you very much, Kara. And uh, feel free to cut and paste the uh, the link, uh, to send the link to on the chat for our audience. So, um, that was a, a, an important part to, uh, to that Kara uh, added to Phil and Kay regarding the social dimension. Most of the performance in the military in particular is done in teams. Um, and sometimes the notion of teams these days have been extended to the human AI team, as, uh, as uh, Kay mentioned that also in her, in her words. So I'm going to try to, again, uh, capture all that through the questions and uh, I'm going to direct some question to all the panel members but some questions are going to be directed also to single panel members and my first question is really a general one I would love each one of you to spend a minute on it so members of our NTSA membership uh, here our NTNC audience um, are folks that uh, design uh, produce acquire and mostly use training systems, training and simulation systems. You made the case already about the centrality of human performance in what you do. Talk from your perspective about why should they pay attention, particular attention now to that dimension of human performance? And Kay, I'm gonna ask you uh, to answer first, if you don't mind. What should the, why should this audience pay attention to what we have to say? I would say because at this point in time, we can. You know, we have the technology and the data where we don't have to design to the lowest common denominator, which is what most human uh, performance support systems do is, you know, you basically have to take you know, the, the common thread and support that, you know, that level in a system. But today, we don't have to do that anymore. Sy uh, systems don't have to be static. They can be dynamic. They can, you know, glean data, data from the individual. They can... Uh, adapt to that individual so that we can really perfect the performance of the individual, not of some common thought of who's performing a task. And so I, I think it's because we have the data and the technology that allows us now to be able to really perfect systems to bring the best out in humans, whether physically, emotionally, you know, cognitively, we really have the capacity to do that at this state in time. Thank you, Kay. Phil, you want to take that on too? Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's important to pay attention to, I think, because both in, in healthcare and in government settings, you know, human compliance is a critical, if not the most critical piece to this, um, you know, and, and so when we think about design, how do we improve compliance, you know, in a way that individuals are actually motivated um, to interact either with the systems or the data, because that's only going to improve the results. And I think the other piece is one of the largest challenges we've seen, whether it's in healthcare or the military, is the interoperability of the flow of such data. And so as a result, you know, there's a lot of great concepts uh, with collecting and using that data. But I would say the reality is, what we've done is created a lot of silos. And as a result, it becomes very difficult for data to interact um, with other data sets and even follow the individual as they move from different locations or different responsibilities. Thank you, uh, Kara. Yeah, um, don't we wanna know why these systems are working? So I'll go back to what you said, Daniel, earlier, in that we can't improve what we can't measure. 
I think we're really going to see uh, that these systems designers and the folks who are acquiring these systems are going to raise the bar on how assessment of human performance is incorporated into these technologies, um, that they have assessment built into them, and that it's valid and reliable. Fingers crossed. Um, and speaking to the data that Phil brought up, I also think that, you know, the military's put a lot of time and effort into how you use data into the future. So thinking not just about what feedback's given to the trainer or the student within a particular system, but how that data lives on in a larger ecosystem over time and across multiple types of students and multiple types of classes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those very thoughtful and complimentary answers. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, ask a few directed questions right now. Some of them are appearing in the Q&A and please place your question in the Q&A. Those things are being recorded. Even if we cannot attend to them today, we will in the future. So um, each one of this is a question that all of us who have been working with the military in particular have been uh, focused on, if not obsessing on uh, over the past several years. But uh, the, the question that uh, Jeremy asked on in real time here is that, can you describe maybe an example? Can you think of an example in your own uh, expertise on how human performance is impacting and being leveraged in the military community in particular? Um, I think examples will help a lot here for folks to understand how we draw from the science on human performance all the way to providing value to the military. Anyone can jump in. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll go first. And so one of the latest things we're doing is working with the CDN, um, you know, the aircraft carriers, and those systems have a huge challenge. The manning on those systems is way down, and the complexity of the systems on those carriers is way up. And also to combine with those two, there's very, very few experts that know how to maintain those systems. So it's a real conundrum, you know, complex systems, fewer people and um, almost no experts. So what do you do? And here's where we've been able to couple the technology with the expertise of the human to really make some gains. In particular, what we're doing is we're using uh, uh, augmented reality technology and we are uh, coupling that with uh, an expert who's performing in the loop, you know, so they're performing in real time, and we're garnering their knowledge as they're interacting with the system. And usually there's only one or two experts, and then they get transitions. So if we didn't do this, the remaining sellers really would not know what to do when the systems went down. The knowledge would not be there. So we, we gather that knowledge uh, in a very clever way, and we get it deep knowledge, not just the surface level step-by-step -step knowledge, but really deep knowledge, because we can do that when we put the individual in context, because that's when a lot of the real tricks and, and tacit knowledge get bubbled up is when they're in the context of performing decision-making and problem solving. We gather all that knowledge, and then we automatically, using AI and ML, we automatically generate a job performance aid that they can you know, put into their, their augmented reality headset and use on the job. No need to generate content. No need to involve software developers. No need to even involve human factors folks. Just, you know, it goes right from the elicitation of the knowledge from the expert to the job performance aid. And then the, the uh, new sellers can get up to speed much quicker. So there is an example where the knowledge, you know, just would be lost as the few experts transition. There'd be no training in place on these new systems. And there'd be no way to get people up to proficiency on them if we weren't integrating you know, the, the, the clever new technology with the expertise of the human. That's a, that's a great example that, that has the, not only a combination of the specific insights you get into the performance in that very uh, challenging environment, but immediately how the technology can actually augment that. That's wonderful. Phil, can you think of an example, um, especially in the military, you worked in very different environments, sports and, and others, but a recent example in the military in which you show how it's been leveraged by the military community. Yeah, I think a, a, a good example, I was <clears throat> at Fort Hood last week and one of the generals, you know, explained one of the great parts of America is, you know, the diversity that we have. Um, but also mention that that is what creates a challenge in human performance 
um, within the U.S. Armed Forces because there are so many backgrounds and different types of individuals that we can't assume responses to, um, at least on the physical realm, exercises are the same. And that's further challenged by, unfortunately, more unfit population that the armed forces are receiving. And so it's the diversity and the more unfit population is really forcing um, the armed forces to better tailor how individuals are onboarded physically and what thresholds, you know, are the right thresholds to not only improve physical performance, but more importantly, not break people. Um, a great example is there was a study done a couple of years ago in the Army where individuals that ran half of the volume had similar fitness performance scores in tests, but had half the number of injuries, right? So it's a good example of, you know, how do we start tailoring some of these volumes and training to adapt to the diversity of individuals, but also you know, a lower physical, I guess, uh, acumen that they're coming in with uh, compared to 10 or 20 years ago. What, what a, uh, an excellent example about this notion that how the demographics and uh, the new uh, fighting force that is coming into the military is actually changing our very conception of human performance. That's a uh, uh, Kara, I know that you've worked uh, quite a bit with the Army Research Institute and uh, on, uh, you know, especially on your team work uh, in the field. Can you can you give another example, the third and, and last example here on how a better knowledge of human performance is impacting and, and being leveraged in the military community? Yeah, I'll give what I think is a cool example. It's a few years old, but we were studying um, brigade staff environments, which are pretty large. They have like 70 or so people, some different uh, war fighting functions. And the commander of the brigade has to make a decision on who is going to sit where physically, oftentimes. Um, and we were collecting communications data within the context of that. And we were able to show um, some basic social network um, information, like who was central, what kind of boundary spanning was happening across the war fighting functions. Mm -hmm. And that helped that brigade commander make physical decisions on how his staff was going to look and where they would sit. And that was pretty helpful to him. Um, so that, that would be a good example of understanding the team performance and then how that had an impact on the design, the physical design of the layout of that staff. Yeah, it's it's interesting because all three examples show that beyond the natural intuition of a commander or a decision maker in the in the military, uh, we are not nixing that. We are actually providing augmentation to that with our with our technologies and our solutions. It's not we're not replacing the the wisdom and the experience and the insights that uh, that decision makers have we are just doing that to augment and have the, the entire unit in that case so the the individual reach to another level of performance um talking about that uh, can i have a question for you here um uh, somebody asked uh, yesterday please uh, tell us about initiatives to shorten the time from getting information from subject matter experts into training and education services. What do we know or how do we know how to do that in our field? Shortening right. the time, basically picking the brain of subject matter experts and putting that into training systems. Yeah, so um, I already you know, alluded to that when I spoke earlier. And so th this is something that we have been working a great deal on because to me, the biggest bottleneck with adding you know, digital enablement to your enterprise is content, right? So if you're going to have an XR system, if you're gonna have some kind of support system, where's the content coming from? And you can imagine if you have an organization that has many, many, many tasks and activities that you wanna support and you wanna digitally enable, it, the barrier to entry seems impossible. You know, if you have thousands, even hundreds of tasks, how are you gonna create the content for all of those to have point and need support? And so we started thinking about this probably about mm, seven, eight, 
years ago when I, I love the Gartner hype, hype cycle. And you saw that augmented reality was just sitting there in the trough of dis disillusionment and it wasn't going into productivity and it was just sitting there, sitting there. And so, you know, in diving into that, to that, I thought it really is because there's a lack of a killer app, right? Why, what's going to motivate companies to be able to, you know, to say, okay, let's, let's put the ROI in, let's, you know, adopt this technology. And to me, it really boiled down to barrier to entry. Too much content needs to be made. It's too difficult. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing without digital enablement because it's easier. So we tackled the idea of knowledge elicitation to automatic generation of content. Mm -hmm. And when we first dove in and we looked at the knowledge acquisition and elicitation field, you know, there are decades and decades of work in that field. But they always required a human in the loop, a human factors person, a psychologist in the loop. And that's not tenable. You know, that's just not tenable. So we started to figure, you know, to really figure out how can we do it without the human loop. We condensed the literature into a very clever set of probes and prompts. And we then said, you know, the best way to get this information is in context. And so not only did we decide to use the technology for the job performance aid, but also for the knowledge elicitation tool. And so we took the augmented reality, we put experts in context, we prompt them with this clever set of questions and we get into their deep you know, tacit knowledge as well as the implicit and the explicit knowledge, which is easier to get. And then once we have all that knowledge, this is where I think it becomes really fun. And I mentioned that we use AI and ML at this point because we don't just recreate what they said or did, but we use this paradigm where we, it, we ask some questions that allows us to uh, basically generate content that's appropriate for an individual. So is it a novice? Is it an expert? Is it a competent person? You know, where are they on the proficiency continuum? And then we adapt the, the knowledge that we've elicited to the right support information that an individual would need based on their proficiency. So you, know, you take an expert, you prompt them cleverly, you get all this data, and all of a sudden you have knowledge, novice to expert point of need support in an augmented reality headset. And no need for you know, human factors, people in the loop, and no need for a bunch of software developers, and no need for all of those things that keep you out of you know, digital enablement and adopting these technologies because it's just the barrier to entry is too high. You break those barriers down. So that to me is you know, where the field is evolving to at this point. Yes, that's, that's, a great, that's a great story because that's been a big challenge of our field to try to simplify, how would I say, the extraction of uh, knowledge and 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 experience and try to 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 operationalize that in technology. My next two questions are actually to uh, Phil and then and then Kara, and that has to do with measurement. There are a lot of questions that are coming in about you know the human human uh, the human performance is still kind of a black scary box for many people, and and the notion of quantifying even human uh, behavior. And human performance is uh, it's 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 looked upon sometimes with suspicion by folks who are not in the field. So, question for you, um, uh, Phil: How are human physiological measures uh, being used? Uh, can you give an uh, first an, ex an example of physiological measures, and then how have I, have you used that, especially in the context of the military? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, certainly, you know, human performance has that perception as a black box. And with machine learning and AI, you know, coming onto the scene, it's only heightened that that fear and concern, right? Because, um, you know, a lot of times in healthcare in the military, you set studies and you can see all these things and it's, it's very linear uh, when it comes to a traditional research study. And machine learning just doesn't work that way. It's far more complex and has far greater opportunity, but it has also far less visibility, um, which is scary, particularly for practitioners um, that are trained and used to seeing traditional research studies. You know, I think, you know, the way we look at, you know, some of the measurements that are being used, we kind of look at kind of three groups. There's action data, you know, a lot of which is good examples are wearables. Um, you know, how much are you sleeping? How many steps did you take, right? Those, those are really 
great you know, evolutions that have occurred recently to gather a lot of action data. There's a lot of volume there. Then there's really assessment data, you know, and, and with all this activity you're doing, you know, how are you responding to that? How are you changing? How is your, whether it's through some type of movement screen, how are you actually responding to those activities? And then the last piece is outcomes data. And outcomes data, you know, in this space, you know, really is around performance and injury. Are you, are you, who's getting injured in what areas, what's the severity? And then what are some of the results from performance testing, you know, two mile run tests, you know, how are those changing, right? So those three groups within the military, we see wearables being used for action data. We see movement assessments being done. And then ultimately there are these performance and injuries that are being collected. And then ideally we're linking all three of those together back around so the action data can then be more prescriptive in nature. Thank you. And indeed, I mean, uh, good measurement is a prerequisite to, to, to performance augmentation, well targeted. And uh, the other question has also to do with measures, Kara's for you. Um, and, and again, please give examples of uh, that you've seen in, uh, in uh, the field or, uh, or, uh, that, or even in the lab. Uh, people are asking a lot of question about reliability of those measures and validity of those measures. But uh, one question in particular asks, what does it take to do real time, real time measures of human performance? Can you give some examples of recent development in sensors or in, uh, in uh, the team environment? Pick one. Yeah, this is a great question. I feel like we could fill a whole webinar <laughs> of just answering this question. And I'm a, a psychologist, so I'm going to say it depends. Um, but I'll go into a little in depth here. Um, I'm going to assume by real time, this person means assessment that happens as the individual or the team are performing or immediately after. Um, but it has me thinking about how we categorize types of assessments, because every type of assessment um, is going to take different things to make it happen. So how I break up an assessment, and Phil, it was really interesting to hear you describe your, your categories of the physiological. Um, I break it up in terms of where the data is coming from. So oftentimes we have human observers doing the assessments or the real or the measures of human performance. Other times it's self-reporting. These are real traditional ways by which we gather data. And then the third category is systems data, which includes a lot of the data that Phil was just talking about. It also might include organizational data or um, tests that somebody can do on the computer. And um, each of these has a time element of it and has different requirements, right? So doing assessment via EEG has certain time requirements to like get a baseline and then be able to utilize that data. It's much different than when you have a checklist, you know, for observers or some behavioral anchor grading scales. And so I think to dig into that question, you really have to think about what is it I'm measuring, why am I measuring it, and how I'm measuring it. And the methods by which you choose to measure will dictate um, what it takes to do it and do it well. Great. Thank you. Uh, switching to a, a little more global uh, question for, for, again, a combination of questions from our audience, but um, what barriers um, and also what investment to overcome these barriers, perhaps you should, you would advise how many people that are making decisions in our audience about uh, about programs and about project and about the, uh, acquisition and initiatives in the area. So what barriers currently exist in the DOD for a better integration of the science and technology of human performance into the design of advanced training system in particular? And what investment would you like to see in the field of human performance in the DOD to overcome some of those barriers perhaps? So they can be psychological barriers, they can be financial barriers. So that has to do with our field in the DOD. Any advice, any recommendation, any um, diagnosis on those barriers? I, I can take that. And um, 
to Carr's point, like we could fill a whole webinar of <laughs> barriers and the DOD. Um, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, that's at least a two day webinar. You know, I think, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges we see is the connectivity, um, you know, and the interoperability of the data, you know, and I'll give an example. We work with groups within the DOD. Um, we have a cloud software, you know, and information has to be downloaded onto a CD and sent to another unit by mail and then uploaded from that CD into the new locations database, right? Meanwhile, while that process is happening, more data is being collected from the original source, right? So this process is already outdated by the time it gets to the new unit, right? So connectivity is such a huge piece, especially when we talk about real time information to improve human performance. Um, I think that connectivity is a, a big piece. And I think the other piece is, you know, which we've hit on is the reliability of metrics, you know, you know, rather than try and do, you know, boil the ocean, how do we identify, you know, how to do better with less, which metrics, you know, are the most important to key in on. And therefore let's track those longitudinally. But again, that, that longitudinal connection really relies a lot around interoperability. Okay. Thank you. So these, these are a lot of uh, the, the technical uh, uh, barriers in a sense. Are there other barriers such as a mindset or perhaps uh, 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 organizational barriers that you can see and any advice of how to overcome it? Okay. Or, or yeah, I'll, I'll take it next. Definitely we see acquisition is the biggest barrier and ATO, you know, authorization um, to operate as a huge barrier. And there, there are a lot of good solutions that have been developed in the R&D world that just never get into the hands of, you know, I mean, you can't even give it to them for free because I've tried. <laughs> um, you know, so that to me, there's so much good research that could improve human performance. And there's, there's solutions available today and we just can't get it in their hands. And I find that incredibly frustrating and I'm not sure what it's going to take to overcome that. I know we've tried to, you know, get speedier programs, you know, research programs like AppWorks and those kind of things. And you might get speedier research done, but you still don't get speedier acquisition done. So that to me is huge. And the other thing I think is a big barrier right now is a lot of the technologies such as the wearable technologies aren't made in the U.S., and so that limits what the DOD can do with those technologies. And that's, you know, a lot of good stuff is happening elsewhere. And if we can't use it, that's going to put us behind. So those are two big barriers that I see. Thank you. And Kara, if you had a magic wand uh, and you could make those barriers, uh, what, how would you use your magic wand to make those barriers, uh, if not disappear, or at least mitigate them, but also any advice you have for uh our, part, our partners in the DOD side of things. Yeah, I mean, I just want to stress the importance of evaluation, showing, having proof, having proof that something works or it doesn't work. I think a lot of emphasis is put on innovation and coming up with new ideas and new technologies and new methods, which is amazing and really important. But if we don't understand what we've already developed and what works and doesn't work, really how good are those future technologies and methods gonna be? And so I wish we could learn a little bit more from the things we've already created in order to build better things in the future. So I guess that's what I would say. I don't know how to solve those problems. That's just my greatest wish and has been my wish for 25 years. <laughs> right, so we need to get you a magic wand then. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, going from the notion of barriers and, and, and uh, difficulty, I want to switch back to, I'm going to ask for even the time for one minute answers, no more, for each one of our panelists about, of all the things that they've seen, what is the biggest source of excitement in terms of new development that are give us, giving us hope to make people 
improve their fitness, improve their decision making, improve their human performance in general? What is a single thing that um, gives them hope and, and excitement about, about working on, on the future of human performance? Kara. <laughs> data, 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 all kinds of data everywhere is super exciting, especially as a team's researcher who's focused on certain ways of collecting data about teams. I just am so excited about the data we can gather on collective entities. Excites me to no end. Thank you. Phil, what excites you these days? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing that excites excites me is all of the machine learning analyses that are now possible to address a very complex problem that before really was just simple correlations of one thing versus another when just the human body is so complex that we're discovering how interconnected all the systems are. Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to give you a pass on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to spin off of where Kara was uh, and a particular type of data, the digital phenotyping. You know, the idea that we could really understand the human better and be able to support the human in ways never before able to do, such as right now, you know, the work someone asked about suicide. And right now, DARPA is doing some wonderful digital phenotyping work to, to look at, you know, those kind of suicidal ideations and tendencies. And, you know, that's just one example of many. I mean, even communication with your significant other every day. You know, we could make everyday life better with the data we have today by digital phenotyping. And I just find that so exciting that we would take all these data beyond the enterprise and into everyday life and enhance the capabilities of people and make their lives better. That to me, it may be a bit Pollyanna, but to me, that is super exciting. No, I don't think it is Pollyanna, uh, Kay. I think this is the reason many of us through our medical, organizational, cognitive, or even engineering the uh, uh, direction came into this field. We are recognizing that human beings are different from each other and to have today the technology the technology to individualize this notion of performance enhancement life enhancement actually health enhancement by understanding how individuals differ from each other is the great promise of tomorrow and maybe another promise i'm going to work with that morale perhaps to organize a second part of that <laughs> webinar because we are overwhelmed with questions and as Kara said, those questions are very thoughtful, very smart, and I want to give them justice. So maybe, uh, maybe we can work on a part two webinars. And thank you so much for uh, for our panelists. You guys uh, brought a lot of light to this discussion, and uh, I'll pass it on back to you, Brett. You you may want to unmute yourself first. That usually helps. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Serfati and our speakers for their insights today and the time they took to be here. Also want to thank the, um, the attendees uh, a lot for your comments and questions, uh, very insightful. And we use that information with our planning committee as we, we identify other subjects that fit this webinar format. I uh, want to let you know we're not going to be having a webinar in May and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody at TSIS in June. Uh, have a terrific day, and thanks again for being here with us.